Now, from Wichita's most listened to sports radio, 97.5 and 1240 KFH, this is Sports Daily with Jacob Albrock and Tommy Kester. All right, welcome in, everybody, to another edition of Sports Daily. Jacob Albrock here alongside Tommy Caster. Max Power in producing for us this week. Uh, coming up today on the program, we will get into the latest uh, in the Kentucky coaching search as it relates to Baylor and potentially relates to a coach around here we follow closely. We'll get you caught up there. The Royals win and walk off exciting extra inning fashion last night behind a strong performance uh, by the bullpen, quite frankly. So we'll get into that as they take down one of the best teams in baseball on the way and continue to show us this year that it appears to be a great summer of baseball impending. So we'll do all of those things as we move forward. A couple of really interesting names into the transfer portal yesterday across college basketball. Uh, two of the bigger names in college basketball, one of which has ties to this area. Uh, we'll take you through that. We've got Wichita State Athletic Director Kevin Saul coming up at the top of the next hour. We'll get the latest on the Shockers. Speaking of the transfer portal, it's been quiet. Nothing doing so far in the transfer portal, at least coming in. So we'll talk about that, the efforts there uh, to uh, bolster their ability to go get those players. Lots to come on the program today, including your calls on the KFH hotline at 869-1240. That's one way to get in touch with the program. Another way to get in touch with the program is to watch us on our video stream and leave your comments on our Facebook, our YouTube, or our X pages. We can see those comments. We can even put those up on the stream for you. A lot to get to today, Tommy. It's a good day. It's good midweek day. How are you this morning? Man, it's a busy day. We're in that uh, you know middle of the work week and, and just so much going on. I feel like I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off today, but it's worth it. Ready to, to sit here, talk some sports today, uh, talk about college basketball. The Royals looks like uh, they're for real, so I'm excited to talk about them. Uh, a lot to get to on the show. Yeah, it has been uh, – it's been – I I feel like it has been a really long week, like a long week. Um, not sure why that is. Monday felt particularly long. Maybe it's the Eclipse stuff. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's because we stepped too late watching a national championship. But then yesterday kind of dragged too. Um, so <laughs> – Maybe we can speed things up every a little day, bit and get every to a nice day warm in my weekend. world kind of drags, you know, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's uh it's a busy time uh professionally. It's tax season. That can stretch the hours out just a little bit uh to all those dealing with that. I feel your pain. I understand where you're at on that. Uh hopefully this is an escape from all that nonsense. Um all right, Tommy. Let's let's start with Kentucky. So we are to the point of this, I think, with the no's um, that we are to Scott Drew. And some reports say that that job has been offered to Scott Drew. Uh, some, I don't think, are quite that far into the process and, and as far as the reporting goes. But it sounds like there's certainly interest, and it sounds like there may be interest both directions. So we wait now to get... You know, what if history tells us anything, we'll either get an announcement that he's leaving or some video that, you know, says he never even thought about leaving or whatever, whatever, you know, that the, the social media stuff is. But we'll, we sh I bet you we find out in the next 24 hours if, in fact, that job has been offered. And then that obviously brings up the elephant in the room in all of this, which we've been pointing to since the second Calipari was fired. And that's that Jerome Tang could potentially return home to Baylor, which would make obvious sense if that was the case. Now, I've talked to people that are, you know, relatively annoyed to hear that. They're like, we just went through this and he did the video and, you know, there was religious undertones. I'm like, guys, like you got to you got to just be real to the situation here. He was there for 20 years, right? Like he he cut his teeth there, everything. It's a parochial school. Um. Baylor's going to have to have a chance to match Scott Drew, I would imagine. Scott Drew, you know, financially, the raise to Kentucky would be significant. I think the biggest reason Scott Drew would go to Kentucky would be the financial component of it, where they would, you know, by some accounts, triple his salary, essentially. Um, if that's the case, there's not going to be anything Baylor can do about that other than try to raise the money. So we'll see. that. That's the part. We talked about this for two hours yesterday. We don't know that part. The other part that's interesting to me now, Tommy, is seeing the reaction of a lot of Kentucky fans 
that Scott Drew wouldn't be good enough. And I'm so sick of Kentucky fans and all this. A, you shouldn't have run Cal out of town, in my opinion. Now, B, you're saying Scott Drew's not a good enough hire? He's way better than John Calipari was when John Calipari got that job. Way better. Way more qualified. Dude has won a national championship at Baylor. Baylor. And has turned them into a perennial power. To say he's not qualified, like if I'm a Kentucky fan upset, like, come on now. Now, would he be my top choice? No, but he had, he is in an unreal hire for that job. The, the, I mean, there's nobody outside of the names that have been out there that would just sort of be pipe dreamy type names. You want to talk about qualifications for the job? Are you kidding? Have you watched college basketball in the last decade? There aren't very many people that have had as much success as he's had at Baylor. Yeah. Baylor was nothing. Baylor was right. dead. Yeah. And, and that's the biggest, I think, storyline with Scott Drew is not just the national championships, not just the competition at the top of the Big 12 year in and year out, but the fact that he was able to pull Baylor out of the depths of despair. That's the bottom line. You mentioned Kentucky fans. I'm sick of him too, because I've seen the social media diatribes about how if they bring in Scott Drew, that's at best a lateral move from John Calipari. And maybe they're right. Maybe they are right. But you ran John Calipari out of town. And I think it was the right thing. Don't get me wrong. Like it was clear that there needed to be a break between John Calipari and Kentucky. But, I mean, who are you going to get the ghost of that offer up walking in there to coach? I mean, that's not going to happen. So, like, I, I don't know exactly what Kentucky fans are expecting. You I know? think they thought Dan Hurley would just take that job, right. honestly. Yeah. Or that Billy Donovan would come back from Chicago, you know, and, and coach Kentucky. Both of those were, you know, and I, I like the way that I've mentioned Pete Thamel before in regards to this search. Pete Thamel from ESPN kind of has the, the candidates separated or at least he did by like aspirational candidates and realistic candidates you know and the aspirational candidates are the Dan the danny hurleys and the jay wrights and the nate oates and uh, the billy donovans of the world and then you've got the more realistic ones doesn't mean they're bad coaches scott drew's a hell of a coach you know but that's more of a realistic hire uh you know than some of these other names and I just, I, it's laughable to me. You know, people are saying, well, you're going to go out there and get Scott Drew. I mean, that's a downgrade or that's a lateral move from John Calipari. You wanted this, guys. You wanted John Calipari out. They deserve every second of this. And again, I think Scott Drew would be fine at Kentucky. Do I think he'll live up to whatever this expectation? And this is why I wouldn't take the job if I was Scott Drew. Quite, quite honestly, this is this is the reason I would not take that job if I was Scott Drew. Because if I'm Scott Drew and I go in there and I win a championship, one, in seven or eight years, and that's it, they're going to run me out of town too. I don't want any part of that if I'm Scott Drew. What I have now is better than that. Financial components aside, because when you can more than triple your salary, you got to pay attention to that too. Like if, if you can make in Kentucky in three years what you could make at Baylor at nine, right. like I, I get that. I understand that. Baylor will bring a raise to the table. I have to imagine. And if Baylor doesn't bring a raise, no, did. but I mean to the, I mean to this specific situation, if they don't come back and, and offer a significant amount more then they don't deserve to keep him either. Like then he has outgrown your program, you know, cause he's going to have to make a, a, a personal decision. That's not the best financial decision to stay at Baylor. If, if you can't help him do that, even, at least a little bit, then he's outgrown Baylor, right? D does that make sense? Like if they can't, yeah. if and, they and you can't try I... to bridge it a little bit, then, then that's one thing. But I, I'm just telling you, like I would not want any part of a fan base that doesn't think I'm qualified enough to come to Kentucky. I want nothing to do with that because you're destined to fail yeah. there it goes in that back, scenario. It goes back to what we briefly mentioned at the end of the show yesterday, the words double leverage. And that's kind of the unique situation that we're in right now or could potentially be in with Scott Drew. He already got a raise. He got a raise just a couple of weeks ago in connection with we the Louisville job. just don't know job, the details of right? it. Right? And that's so he, the problem. he was linked kind of to the Louisville job. Um, I never thought that was a great fit. He ended up, he was able to kind of parlay that interest, I guess, into a raise and a contract extension. And now he could potentially do it again with Kentucky. And so we don't see that very often where, or maybe ever, I can't think of 
a time when a coach got two raises and two contract extensions in one coaching cycle, but it's Kentucky. That's what happens when a job like Kentucky opens up. And so, you know, of course, this isn't you know more than likely Scott Drew personally. This is more his representation, regardless of what happens and where he's coaching next season. His representation is going to try to make sure that he capitalizes one way or another, either makes the most money at Kentucky or gets Baylor to actually go back even just two weeks later and give him even more, you know? And so th that's what makes this more of a unique situation. Yeah. And it's not, look, it's not Scott Drew's fault that this has happened. So right. like, I, I don't think you can't personal be personally offended that that would happen. Kentucky opened up and has interest. That's not Scott Drew didn't do that. Right. So if, you, if if and and I don't think personal stuff like that comes into the equation here. I, some accounts have him at just over five million a year, and we've heard Kentucky for for their aspirational hires maybe was going to pay as much as ten or eleven million. I don't know that they would put that kind of offer together for Scott True Drew. It would probably be at least what Cal was making, which was eight and a half. So you know you're talking about a a fifty sixty percent raise there. It just it's it it comes into. And again, that's not Scott Drew's fault. He's good at what he does. If somebody, you know, comes to you and 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 you're their employer, and you know some other job comes and offers him a lot of money, you got to decide at that point yeah. if you can counter it or if you got to just throw your hands back. We can't. I'm sorry, like yeah. we can't do that. And then and then and then you just let it go and you don't you don't worry too much about it. Baylor has a lot of good options. Probably if he does go. Um, they're going to have to pay somebody either way. So, you know, their, their job right now is to raise the funds to pay either Scott drew more or the next coach. Cause they're going to have, let's say it's, you know, let's say it's uh McCasland or Jerome Tang. You're going to have to probably at least give those guys a raise and they're making pr pretty good money right now, especially Tang, you know, Tang's up around three and a half or so. So you're going to have to, you know, are you willing to put him in the door with, you know, with two years of head coaching experience at what you were paying Scott drew? Maybe you are, I don't know. This is all very interesting because there is a financial component. Baylor does need the ability to match that. And that's probably what's happening right now. If in fact, Kentucky has made its offer and if they match, if they get close to it and they get to a good enough number again, like seeing the diet that, you know, the, the dynamic right now among the fan base with that, like that's the part of this, like that I've talked about now, from the beginning, um, if I'm a guy who already has it established and I'm already in a position to win national championships where I'm at and the money's not the biggest factor, I'm not sure I want to walk into that job right now. Now, if somebody comes in there, follows Cal, doesn't have a, you know, the level of success that's necessary and then gets run out of town and, and sort of gives this reality check slap in the face to that fan base. Yeah, then you want to come in. Right. You don't want to be the guy that follows the guy. You want to be the guy that follows the guy that follows the guy. Right. Like we all know that. So, you know, is the timing right for Scott Drew? If it's anything other than money, I would say no. And, and that's not the case for every coach out there. There are plenty of coaches. The question for me becomes if Kentucky doesn't get Scott Drew. Then they've it swung and really missed weird. now about four yeah, or five times. It gets really weird after that. If Scott this Drew is always go. why I say don't run great coaches out of town. You mm -hmm. ran Cal out of town, and now you've missed on your top four or five guys. Now, again, this isn't Kentucky, the school's fart. They didn't run Cal out of town. The fans ran Cal. Cal was sick of dealing with fans, I think, I assume. Dealing with these unrealistic expectations needed a fresh start. So... If you've now done that fan base, and I'm speaking directly to any Kentucky fans out there right now, if you've run Cal out of town and let's say you don't get Scott Drew and you've missed on probably your top five candidates, I told you so. Like, you better be careful what you wish for and here. Now, it. that doesn't mean you yeah. can't go find the right guy. It just means you're not what you, you, you these these programs, Tommy, are never what the fans think that they are. They never are. I get it. and. By that logic, I understand, like, if Scott Drew is just like, look, the money's great, the opportunity is great, I, I think he ought to take it, but I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd fault him by saying, look, the fan base, the donor base, all of that, I don't want to mess with that, I've got it pretty good at Baylor, I don't want to do that, but at the same time, then I think that there are probably a lot of other coaches out there that would 
could probably say the same thing. Like, man, Kentucky, yeah, it's a great opportunity. And, and maybe the risk is worth the reward, you know, for some of these more up-and-coming coaches. But if you're established and you've got it good, like Mark Few, I've heard his name dropped a few times. I've heard Mark Pope at BYU who came from Kentucky, you know, is a, another name potentially. But wh why leave what you have that's good to go and deal with an unrealistic expectations of a fan base? I, I do want to mention Jerome Tang here briefly. Right now, and I haven't looked this morning, but as of last night, Scott Drew was the betting favorite to go to Kentucky. Jerome Tang was the betting favorite to go to Baylor. So th there is some smoke oh, there. Oh, sure. There yeah. is some smoke yeah. there from the odds makers. And, and here's the thing, and I, you mentioned this at the top, about how you've talked to people that are, you know, K-State in that world, and they're saying, well, you know, he just committed, recommitted back to Kansas State, and, you know, there were religious undertones to his video and, and all of that. And, and I want to be very clear before I say this. I don't know what's in Jerome Tang's heart or in his head. I don't even want to pretend to guess. But he's been very clear over the time that he's been at Kansas yeah. State to now about how he will go where God leads him. He said those words exactly. He's very outspoken yeah. about that sort of thing. In my mind, again, I don't know what's in his head. I don't know what's in his heart. I don't want to, I don't want to speak for him. But I think it could be conceivable where he could take this if Scott Drew goes to Baylor Take this as a sign of I turned down no Arkansas question. and then my home came open and yeah, it wouldn't no have come question. open had I not turned down Arkansas. You know what I mean? So if like I can see those it, kind it, of connections being made. I, I wouldn't under I, I'm 100 percent with you. I, I wouldn't have one ounce of animosity yep. if he did that, because is Baylor a significantly better job than Kansas State? It's not. I mean, it's not. It's better. Um it's probably it's not only, significantly better. I don't but it's think. Better. I don't think it's better. It's only that it's only perceived to be better because Scott Drew has turned it into a national contender every year. I think if you take that, if you take Scott Drew out of that equation, it, I, don't, I think it's. Better I don't be, know that I. You're would. right, but it's. I think it's also better because remember, it's a private institution, so they've got probably, and I don't know the amount of donors, but I would imagine because you probably have more wealthy donors at a university like Baylor. Yeah, I'll bet you, you I'll State. bet you I'll, I'll bet you that and I can look at the endowments and stuff. I, I highly doubt that Baylor is in a much better NIL position, which is all that really matters than Kansas State. The point is for me though, and I agree with you, I, I, I can't ever fault anybody for going home. Like isn't that the dream like to you know to to be able to do what you love doing and be home while you do it. Unfortunately 100%. for a lot of us, that's not possible. And so I, I got no fault for that. That would be like, that would be like getting mad at uh, Brad Underwood. If he decided then to come back to K state. No, you it's home, man. Like, you know, so it it's in, it's, it could be unavoidable or Jerome Tang may love it and be like, nah, man, I, I like what we got going here. And that's, you know, that that was a great time in my life. This is my place now. Who knows what's in his head and in his heart and how much, you know, the president there at Kansas State has impacted right. and influenced that. Uh, but that stuff matters. And again, Scott Drew still has to accept this Kentucky job if, in fact, it has been offered, which is being reported in some places uh, here late last night. And then we'll see. And look, if 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 I, and I know that really, really bites if you're a K-State fan. But if if Baylor is the place that costs you Jerome Tang, you just got to throw your hands up. You know what? There yeah. was nothing you could do. You know about what this that. reminds me of? And it's not exactly the same, but it reminds me a little bit. It's got tiny shades of the Roy Williams in North Carolina situation. Because remember, bit, yeah. Roy Williams was offered Carolina, I think, in 2000 when Bill Guthridge retired and he turned it down to stay at Kansas. And there were interviews with Roy Williams later where he said, never in my wildest dreams did I think it would open again after only three years. It didn't work with Matt Doherty, and they went to Roy again, and he left, and he went back home to North Carolina. Not exactly the same thing, but, you know, Jerome Tang turned down Arkansas to stay at Kansas State, and that yeah, has no, directly, the same. That's directly led now, potentially, to Scott Drew going to Kentucky and Baylor, his home, opening up. So uh, there are some shades of that for sure, where if one thing didn't, if one thing didn't happen, then you wouldn't be in this, you know, position right now. Yeah. I, again, I think it's very similar. Like you, there's animosity because you're like, well, why did you leave us to go there? This is the, there, there's some of that with K-State Baylor. I think K-State's as good a basketball job as Baylor. Now, again, 
that's that's because of the impact I'm putting on Scott Drew specifically being at Baylor. If Scott Drew's not at Baylor, I mean that's a it's an it's still a Big Twelve job, right? It's still, but are they still in the same position without Scott Drew that they are with him? Probably not. Now, if Jerome Tang's there, maybe, probably, honestly, but probably so, and that's why they would go after him very aggressively. But I don't think historically, or in the big picture. If you if you stacked jobs up all over the place and said, you know, let's power rank these jobs with nobody in place specifically and just the job itself, I don't think Baylor's any better. You know, I think, you know, I, I think it's probably about the same, honestly, um, as as whatever. So K-State's endowment. I don't know what this means. I don't totally understand endowments. Um <laughs> The long-term investment pool for the K-State Foundation is uh, at $974 million. Um, let's look up Baylor here. And again, this is this is uh this is this is more for academic types to understand what any of this means. Uh they're if I read that correctly, the other I mean they're just they're they're under they're over a billion. So maybe, I mean, they're both around a billion. Maybe Baylor's. I, I don't know. What I just don't. I only drew that conclusion because Baylor's a private institution. I I don't have any idea. Well, I mean, Kentucky's a public institution. I would say, you know, Kentucky and Duke are comparable. One's public, one's private. You know, so I so I think you can. I think you can do both. Alabama's the best football job in the country, public school, right? Alabama's probably better than Notre Dame now, public private. I I think it's pot, but I don't know. I don't know Baylor. I just I'm trying to think of like. Again, like if you just put the job side by side, if you're talking to recruits, if you're talking to athletes, I don't know that there's much of a difference in recruiting to Baylor as there is recruiting to Kansas State. Um, I mean, you've got the state of Texas advantage, probably just a bigger pool of players. But none of this matters yet because Scott Drew is still the head coach of Baylor. And we'll see probably shortly. We're going to keep an eye on this throughout the day today because, it, look, it could be a factor here while we're on the air. Who knows? If Scott Drew really wants that job, this isn't going to take him very long. Uh, if he's torn, if Baylor's going to have a chance to come back with something, this could stretch out a day or two. I mean, typically that's about how long it takes in these situations. You've got to have lots of meetings, um, and and we'll see. But it is fascinating. And once we clear this one, everybody, <laughs> you know, unless Duke comes open and wants Scott Drew, like we'll be good for Jerome Tang in Manhattan at Kansas State next year. Uh, my goodness, what a stressful couple of weeks. Uh, you, this is what's. This is funny to me too, Tommy. Like everyone acts like the transfer portal is this nightmare. We have the transfer portal with coaches every year. We always have. And we don't we don't draw the same conclusions of how annoying that is. It's only when the players do this that we get annoyed. We don't we don't get annoyed when the coaches do this every single year. John Calipari just walked away from a contract to go within the conference. Is anybody crying about you know scholarships or whatever or He's no commitment set out to whatever for a with year. John Calipari? He shouldn't be allowed to yeah, play. Like, come on, needs a waiver. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Come on, uh, we don't do the same thing with coaches that we do with players. Uh, let's talk about some of the players that entered the portal yesterday because there's a couple of big names. I, I mean, I th I would think all the teams that we follow here in the state of Kansas should be interested in both of them. We'll get into it next on Sports Daily.
month. Season tickets are sold out. It's time to get back to the sports talk. All right, let's do this thing. Go! Sports Daily is on KFH. All right, welcome back, everybody, here to Sports Daily. Uh, mornings at KFH. The staff enjoys a great cup of coffee from Prairie Fire Coffee. Appreciate them keeping us fueled up, primed up for uh, a fun part of the year here. Uh, you can call it fun. The the transfer portal, the coaching cycle. I I don't hate the transfer portal cycle. Probably it, it 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 gives and it takes away. It sucks when guys go in, but it's also sort of fun to see what guys are out there that you kind of are aware of, and and you know what what players might be out there for your favorite team to to go get to go after whatever it might be. Um, two guys enter the portal yesterday. Uh, that are very, very interesting. You've got, first, we got Mark Mitchell enter the portal. 
So Mark Mitchell, you might remember, was a star at Sunrise Christian. He was really, really good there. He's from the Kansas City, Kansas area, went to Bishop Miege, um, was good there before coming in, became one of the top recruits in the country and and went to Duke. And, and th those Sunrise teams were wild with how much talent they had. So Mark Mitchell goes to Duke his freshman year. He averages nine points and four and a half rebounds. His sophomore year, he averages just under 12 points and six rebounds. And now this 6'9 forward is in the transfer portal. That's really interesting because I cannot imagine that, you know, he's in a better, he's going to find a better NIL situation than Duke, but we see star players do this. And, and Mark Mitchell's not quite a star player yet, but he's a significant player on a good team with star level uh, upbringings and capabilities. So he goes out there, and immediately we think of Kansas when it's a transfer from Duke. Is Mark Mitchell a fit? Well, I don't know. They've added some players at that position. We still don't know about Johnny Furphy. I am of the belief that you try to go get him regardless, and, and you've got depth pieces with the other guys, and you have a rotation of players. You don't worry about that stuff when a guy like him comes out into the market. But... Who knows if they feel like that's a need. The other thing that jumps into my head is Kansas State. And and look, that's why these – and I don't know if Mark Mitchell is, is interested in transferring from Duke to Kansas State, but I wouldn't have thought he would have been interested in transferring out of Duke to begin with. So I don't know what the – because it's not like he wasn't getting minutes at Duke. He was playing almost 30 minutes a game at Duke for the last two years. So – I don't know what sort of market should be out there for a guy like Mark Mitchell. I know that he's as good as any player in the portal that's been in the portal. So we get that news. And because of his Kansas ties, the state of Kansas, we wonder about KU probably first and foremost, and then K-State even to some degree. And then we get the other news that Robbie Avila is out there. Robbie Avila of Indiana State with all the amazing nicknames with, you know, uh, Cream Abdul Jabbar, Steph Blurry, Larry Nerd, that Robbie Avila, who averaged 17 points, uh, almost seven rebounds and four assists a game, who has a a game skill set that, you know, looks like it belongs out of the best players you see playing down at the YMCA. He's nimble. You know, he's got this uh, uh, odd looking body type for what you see basketball players have. And he's got the big old glasses and all of that stuff. And he's, he, he's, he's turned into most people's favorite player in college basketball, quite frankly. And he's a center. Um, where does he fit Indiana state? See, this is where I think it's now the natural conclusion that I is Purdue, right? Zach Eady's leaving. They obviously have a big hole at center. Robbie Avila, do you just just kind of head right on up the pipeline to Purdue? That would make a lot of sense to me. He's from Illinois. Um, who knows? Everybody's going to be in the market for him, I would think. I don't know that Kansas would be because they have Hunter Dickinson. Um, and, and I don't think Robbie Avila is going somewhere to be a backup. But Kate State has a need there. I mean, certainly Wichita State has a need there. I, again, I think Robbie Avila can shoot, shoot for the sky here, but I, but I don't know that for sure. Like I would be curious to hear uh, a scout's take or a coach's take on whether his game translates to like high power five level basketball. That's, that's what he's going for, but you know, maybe he does end up at a, at a different sort of program. So Robbie Avila's out there. Um, again, a really exciting player, a, a player that has, we've we've thoroughly enjoyed especially late in the season we all you know we all became aware of him sort of as indiana state got screwed in the tournament selection and then you see these teams and you start to kind of pay attention to illinois or to, to indiana state and you see some of their highlights you're like whoa 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 who is this guy like i i, I like this guy why isn't he playing in the ncaa tournament um, and so we all kind of followed him then and at that point. It was like, holy cow, this guy's amazing. He's a blast to watch. Uh, Mark Mitchell, though, is a star. I mean, Mark Mitchell is a big time, big time transfer portal guy. A as, you know, as gifted or as I would imagine highly touted as any player, any player that there is in the country. 
high, high pedigree coming from Duke, um, you know, significant player at Duke. Let me go to the, let me go to some of the transfer portal rankings and see if this has been updated with Mark Mitchell. I don't think it has been yet. Um, at least at, you know, 24 seven doesn't have either of these guys in there, uh, just yet, but there are, uh, there are some players in there still. A lot of these guys are decided. Some of the top guys that are in the portal have not decided and have just entered in the last couple of days. Balo at, uh, Arizona is their, their really uh, talented five-star big man. He's in the portal right now. So there, there's a lot of names and, and we do have Kevin Saul coming at the top of the hour. I want to pick his brain a little bit about like, where's Wichita state in all of this? Where are they, you know, where do they stand in all of this? Kansas right now has the best portal ranking by team, according to 247. And I don't know how much work they're still going to do. Uh, I don't know how long this process can take for some of these top guys. Are they willing to wait on Kansas? Because Kansas has to see about, you know, some decisions for their own players. Furphy has to make a decision. Those freshmen, if they're coming back, I, I mean, I think we were all worried about the two freshmen, the two other freshmen, but we haven't had any indication that they won't be back. They're certainly not draft guys and they're not in the portal yet. So who knows? Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's going to be fascinating to watch how much more active they'll be. And then you've got K-State here now. How active can Jerome Tang and the Cats be in the portal when, when we're sitting here staring at this very obvious coaching concern as Scott Drew is being rumored for this Kentucky job? So, you know, I don't know how quickly this stuff can move. We'll try to get a little perspective on that from Kevin Saul on how long these things can drag out because right now for Wichita State it is. So we'll have that coming for you at the top of the hour. Uh do want to tell you that the uh uh I do want to tell you that this portion of the program has been brought to you by Crestview Country Club and the Masters is coming up this week and the golf's getting good and you'll have the Masters to watch but why not play a little golf while the Masters is happening? We're looking at 80 degree weather, uh, some wind I think on Saturday, no wind on Sunday. Isn't that the best time to be out playing golf? Play all the golf you want at Crestview. They got two courses there, north and south. It's a good time of the golf year. One of the one of the real advantages to be in there if you're a golf person is they do have two courses. So you can, I mean, more or less, you can get on anytime you want, one way or the other. And they've also got two driving ranges out there, and they'll have all kinds of fun and festivities going for the Masters. But uh, get in touch with Crestview if you're interested in that. Tell them you you heard us talking about them here. Uh, we are happy to have them as partners with us here on Sports Daily, and we appreciate you uh, them bringing you this portion of the program. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. Uh, we'll wrap up this first hour. Oh, we have Charles on the line. I didn't see that, Max. Sorry, we have Charles on the line. Charles is holding. Charles, welcome in. We'll get you in here before we take a break. What's up? Welcome into Sports Daily. Well, the only thing I would say is in the wild, wild west of college sports, when you think of somebody like Robbie Avila, his, his, his coach just left to go to St. Louis. So sure. he wasn't highly recruited by a lot of schools. And it's a good, it might be a good chance that he's just going to follow that coach over there. Um, and then also, Oh, you think he'd you, go to St. Louis? I, I think his market's going to be a lot bigger than St. Louis. Now, I don't know how, I don't know how to gauge the ceiling for his market because he is not traditional in the way that he looks uh, athletically. Uh, so maybe it's not as high as some of the, but that would be good news. You know, like, I think not not saying like Wichita State specifically, but think of a, a school like Wichita State in the American. I think Robbie Avila could be playing in the American. Don't you? I mean, I don't right. think there's any doubt uh, about that. No, I agree. I just think that sometimes you don't, don't just don't take for granted about how these kids were treated in the recruiting process. And coaches are leaving on a whim. Um, these kids are leaving on a whim. And it's just one of those things where they at Indiana State really had a great rapport with that coach and i mean there's a, i mean they got they got local ties to indiana state there's a there's a local player that i think is also in the portal um from indiana state so i just think that that coach took a lateral move to st louis and i think you'll see kids all over the country just take moves um and it's not based off of kind of what conference these teams are in and power five or non-power five schools is just um, well, I mean, NIL. let's be honest, Char the NIL, the NIL matters, right? And, and you've got potentially here in Avila, 
as marketable, we'll call it, player as as there will be in the men's game next year. I mean, this guy has become a star because of, of, of funny nicknames, and his style is contagious, right? As a viewer, if I'm, you know, if I'm an NIL person, I mean, I'd love to have a piece of Robbie Avila. And so I, I think that probably also increases his value and it'll be value higher than St. Louis. I mean, he'll have bigger well, offers than St. Louis. If he goes there, so be well, it, but that's not going to be his well, best offer. Well, what I would say to that is um, Indiana state made his style a success. So to your own point about him having a YMCA game, he has to go somewhere that's going to allow him to flourish. Sure. Totally. There's no question, but, but, but I think that can, but, I think that's still very possible, very possible. I mean, look, you don't just, it doesn't matter what style you play when you go for, you know, 17, seven and four, that's, oh, that's no, no, impressive. No, it, does. It, it, it does matter the style because he was in a position. I, 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 really I know it matters. I, I understand it matters, but it's not like your programs are gonna be like, Oh, you know what? I, I just don't think we want any piece of that because the, the great coaches are going to get greatness out of great players. And, and I think, I don't think it's a stretch to call him a great player. He's, he can shoot the three. He shoots the three at a, at a relatively high percentage, especially for a big man. Like he, the, he, he looks interesting athletically, but he fits a lot of the way the modern college basketball games changing big men that can handle the ball and shoot the three. He does both of those things. 100% agree. However, he wasn't highly recruited out of high school. And that's where we can say that now on a stage that he was on, but it, that then that's style, his style of play didn't happen overnight. And he has to go. Max I mean, Asmus, Max about, Asmus and, wasn't and recruited. He was at old, he was at Oral Roberts. Max Asmus wasn't recruited highly out of high school. And he was the high, most highly touted transfer portal guy last year. And that's what I'm saying. Like we go in this portal thinking that these kids are better than what they are because of the numbers they put up. The guy out of the K, you got a kid out of Townsend. He didn't have a great season. Like it's a bad example. We, yeah. We, we, no, and that's what I'm saying. We got kids going in the portal, and we think just because they went somewhere, they they are great. Mark Mitchell went to Duke. Some, he has to go somewhere that is going to allow him to play. And the reason why it, that he wasn't really, really probably successful as he could have been at Duke because he really does lack that perimeter jump shot that today's game has. And yes, yeah. I think it'd be awesome for him to go to KU. However, if you look at KU's run in the last few years of a Baji, of Christian Braun, of a Grady Dick, those guys have really good perimeter games that allow that that stretch the floor and shot, they shot the ball really yeah. well. And no, so, I, I agree with that. Um, I don't. I don't know if he's a great fit at KU. Plus, we have to pay attention to who's already on the roster there, right? Like you have to you have to pay attention to the fact that they just brought in a guy at that position from Florida, and we still don't know if Johnny Furphy's coming back. Like, is Mark Mitchell really going to come and be a rotational guy? Probably not. That's probably not because you can't play him and KJ Adams on the floor together if neither one of them can shoot. So right, but I, 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 I agree, and they're the, they're about the same size. Yeah, no, I agree. I I think I I don't think Mark Mitchell's going to end up at KU. I think he could, and I think Bill Self could make it work and figure it out and figure out a way to do it. But I don't, I don't think that's where he'll end up. I don't know where he'll end up. I think he's one of the more interesting names into the portal because he was playing significant minutes at Duke. So it's not like he wasn't getting playing time. I'm not sure why he would be in the portal. Um, Avila to me is very, it, that's a much more traditional portal move. Uh, guy who is at a mid-major, really successful. I do think his game translates. Uh, you know, is, is he going to, He's not going to be, you know, possess the ball probably in the same way he did, but he could fit in a lot of places and bring us, you know, like bring his skill set would translate, you know, can it defensively? I don't, you know, I didn't watch enough of them to know if his defensive skills translate, but if you're just trying to upgrade over Indiana state and profile and everything else, he'll have tons of opportunities to do that, that are, that are to a higher level than St. Louis. Now, if he loves that coach that much, good for him. Uh, but I hope he's the kind of kid I hope that uses the transfer portal to catapult himself into an opportunity he wasn't given after high school, quite frankly. This is the first chance he has had to go be at that level. And I hope he takes it and I hope he gets it because I want to see it. And I think fans want to see it. And I think his entry into the portal is what everybody 
should love about the portal. And Mark Mitchell is what should make us all scratch our heads about the portal. It's like you get both of these in the same day. It's a really interesting dynamic uh, that that's happened, well, right? Mitchell going in, you're like, well, why? Avila going in, that's awesome. We may get to see this guy play at, you know, wherever, Arizona, whatever it ends up being. Uh, but that's, that. you know, I appreciate the call, Charles, and good insight there. I yeah. didn't even realize Indiana State, State's coach went to, went to St. Louis. All right. We got to take that break here. Again, thank you to Crestview for bringing us this portion of the program. Uh, We'll be right back. More sports daily. Kevin Saul, top of the hour. Coming right back at you. Ninety-seven five and twelve forty KFA.
the commercials are over. No, I haven't got all day. 869-1240. Time to get busy. This is Sports Daily on KFH. All right, uh, we're right up against it here. Tommy had to take a call there. I, I do, Tommy. So a call for you. Are you a call guy? No, I hate. I hate calls. Hate them with a passion. I, I, I'm a call guy. I can get more accomplished in one phone call than a day's worth of emails or text messages like that. You can just get it all done right then and there. Just, just be done. You can my take my calls no moving call forward. I'll, I'll just forward them to you. My, uh, you and my my wife would would rather text nine one one if her arm was on fire. Me too. I'm mean, right. Exactly. Like, I I don't I you know I don't really want to be on the phone. Like I I just can you call them for me? And I'm like, what? Why can't you call them? Like just call them. Your what, wife what and I, I are identical it. in that regard. I hate making phone calls. I always feel like I'm bothering the person or I'm catching them off guard or they're not expecting. They don't have to answer. I don't know. I'd rather text them and I'm okay with being like, Hey, do you have time for a call? And then at least I know they're ready. And then I can't, yeah, no, that's, that's, you know? that's become a pretty common courtesy. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. I, I am more of a cold caller. Like if somebody's messaging it. me and I'm like, I don't have time for this. I just call. Them. I hate and I do know people and that I, do that too. I work in sales and I hate cold calling. What about, how does that, work? what about when you're driving? What about when you're driving? Nope. There's nothing better than being on nope. the phone when you're driving. Nothing it. kills that time better than a phone call. That's the one time my wife loves to be on a phone call. No matter what she's doing, if she's driving, she'll call me. Uh, but I love I love driving calls, too, because it passes the time. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to connect with uh, with Kevin Saul. We are fairly certain for our biweekly visit. We'll get his, uh, we'll get his updates on the efforts he told us about a couple of weeks ago to raise a little bit of money, see where the Shockers sit in basketball, as far as the transfer portal, uh, and check in on the spring sports as well. We'll have that next here on Sports Daily. Laugh Out Loud Mornings with Bob and Tom on 97.5 and 1240 KFH, Wichita's most listened to sports radio, always live on the free Odyssey app. Syntec Premium Full Synthetic Motor Oil is formulated for today's engines. Available only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Check engine light on? Take the guesswork out of your check engine light with O'Reilly Veriscan. It's free. Ask for O'Reilly Veriscan today. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Lots of sunshine with lots of wind this morning with temperatures in the upper 40s. Weather brought to you by Robert Half. Nine out of 10 hiring managers are having difficulty hiring today. Robert Half is here to help. At Robert Half, we know talent. Visit roberthalf.com today. Save big money on your next landscaping project now at Menards. Menards is your destination for concrete landscaping blocks. We have the largest in-stock selection ready to take home today. Plus, you can get free estimates fast with our landscape design programs in-store and on Menards.com. Stop in today to check out our landscaping options and for great deals going on in our garden center. Now at Menards. Save big money at Menards. Go Hog Wild Pit Barbecue. Hog Wild, get some for you. It's $5.99 barbecue time. Hurry to Hog Wild for a complete barbecue meal that's sure to fill you up for only $5.99. Josh Wissing, Hog Wild partner and general manager at 47th and South Broadway, has got all the details on this smoking deal. Get a Hog Wild sandwich loaded with our award winning meats like pulled pork, pulled chicken, or hot links, plus your choice of classic side and a drink for just $5.99. Upgrade your sandwich to beef brisket for just a dollar more. Join us for lunch or dinner. You can also order online at GoHogWild.com. Hogwild Pit Barbecue, six locations in Wichita, also in Derby, El Dorado, Hutchinson, and Salina. Go Hogwild Pit Barbecue. Hogwild, get some for you. But don't be late, we close at eight. 
Spring into savings at Maximum Outdoor Equipment and Service. For a limited time, get up to 25% off select models, including Husqvarna, Grasshopper, Ferris, Toro, and Steel. These deals won't last long, so hurry in today for the best selection. Don't wait. Spring into savings and get up to 25% off Husqvarna, Grasshopper, Ferris, Toro, and Steel at Maximum Outdoor. South of 21st and Andover Road or south of Kellogg on West Street or MaximumOutdoor.com. We know mowers. Maximum Outdoor Equipment. Hi, I'm Joshua Sikora, lead CPA for Market Tax Services right here in Wichita, Kansas. If you have tax needs this year, let our team assist you. Our team of CPAs, tax preparers, and enrolled agents are accepting documents and clients now. But you will need to reach out soon as our availability is limited. Market Tax Services. Our two locations are downtown on Main and Waterman or West Wichita on Tyler Road. Get started by calling 316-803-1040 or visiting markettaxservices.com. It's the 16th Annual Independent Living Resource Center Golf Classic at Sand Creek Station in Newton, Friday, May 10th. We welcome players of all abilities and promise a great day of golf at one of the best courses in Kansas. The tournament starts at noon with lunch before and a steak dinner after the tournament and beverages. There'll be awards and chances to win great prizes along with a live auction. Proceeds from the tournament benefit ILRC's Greater Expectations Autism Program for Young Adults with Autism. For more about the tournament, visit ILRCKS.org. Toppers Plus Truck and RV will hook you up for trailer and RV season. Get receiver hitches, goosenecks, fifth wheel hitches, brake controllers, and trailer wiring to ease the towing of your boat, cycle, RV, or lawn equipment. Choose from top brands of hitches, including B&W hitches, Kurt, and Draw Tight. Need to take your vehicle camping with you? Toppers Plus has Blue Ox base plates and tow bars. Get trailer season ready at Toppers Plus Truck and RV, 333 Northwest Street, or toppersplusks.com. Make your truck work for you! The KFH Studios, powered by Devon James Injury Lawyers. Call 888-8888. That's 888-8888. College softball action last night. A huge crowd, 900, stuffed into Wilkins Stadium. Wichita State hosting the number one ranked team in the nation. Three-time defending national champions, Oklahoma. Ah, the Sooners had a 7-0 lead by the top of the second inning, and that was the final score. Oklahoma 7, Wichita State nothing. Shockers have lost 42 times in a row to Oklahoma in softball over the last 34 years. But measure up against the number one team in the nation and see where you are. College baseball last night, Wichita State losing 9-5 downtown at Riverfront Stadium to 21st-ranked Oklahoma State. A game that took more than four hours to play. It featured 14 pitchers and more than 400 pitches thrown. The Shockers leave a season-high 16 runners on base. Shocker pitchers didn't help by issuing 11 walks on the night. Shocks lose their fourth game in a row. I'm Ted, the sports head. Now, from Wichita's most listened to sports radio. 97.5 97.5 and 1240 KFH. This is Sports Daily with Jacob Albrock and Tommy Kester. And welcome back in here to Sports Daily on this Wednesday, a midweek edition. Jacob Albrock alongside Tommy Kester. Max Power producing for us this week. That uh, hotline is 869-1240 as always. Uh, after this segment, you'll have a chance to chime in. You can Chime in your comments, your questions for Wichita State Athletic Director Kevin Saul via our video stream, if you'd like, which you can find on Facebook, on YouTube, and on X. We do welcome in Kevin Saul. Kevin, how are you? I'm well, Jacob. How are you? We're doing good. The weather's turning for us a little bit. You know, we're getting to that time of year. Maybe, uh, you know, try to, you know, other people that aren't that maybe have time in their lives, get out, play a little golf, get closer to the pool weather. It's the spring sports season, which we want to get to. You heard the updates from two big games last night uh, from Ted there just before the break, and we got another one coming tonight. More on that in just a little bit. Last time when we had you in, Kevin, and we talked to you and we talked to Paul Mills, you guys were talking about an effort uh, in the NIL front to uh, in empower, I guess, the fan base and some people. How has that gone since then to get those funds up there Uh, and ready to compete for the Shockers. We've certainly made significant progress. We will, uh, I think here in the next three or four business days, uh, the folks at Blueprint Sports will be putting up a campaign meter uh, on the website, so there'll be a real-time update there. Um, But like several hundred uh, folks, I think it's probably pushing 500 at this point uh, since it was launched, maybe 
what, 10 days, two weeks ago. So certainly been some really good progress. Um, and I, I would tell you it's a multiple time daily conversation. And um, I, I think for the most part, there's an understanding of the importance of NIL and connecting it to uh, retention and recruitment of elite level talent. Um, so that understanding is there. I still think there's reluctance, which is certainly understandable. Um, and at the end of the day, just trying to educate. And, and we've had a lot of folks that have come and say, look, I, I don't necessarily care for where we are, but understand this is a really critical and important pathway for us to get to. And uh, we want to support it. So that, that part's been good. Kevin, as you've been making the rounds uh, around Wichita and, and talking to the stakeholders and, and sharing the vision of NIL and all of that, uh, what, what's been your major takeaway, the, the major reaction that you've heard from uh, the fans, from the donors, from, from people that are really invested into Wichita State Athletics? Yeah, I think it's been a, a combination of a, of a lot of things. Um, it has been, Tommy, whether it's a podcast with Paul Solentrop, uh, we hosted uh, right around 100 <clears throat> donors, um, season ticket holders, supporters in the Champions Club last week and did a nice event there where we talked very candidly about NIL and its importance to our program, uh, to these radio opportunities. So I can't thank you guys enough for the opportunity to come on and talk about these things. Uh, to our quarterly AD letter, to our social media campaigns. To, you know, there's a lot, and it, you have to take a shotgun approach, try and hit as many folks as possible. And I would say that the overwhelming response has been an understanding of the importance of NIL to recruitment and retention, uh, a reluctance about, about where college athletics is uh, right now, but understanding this is currently the world that we live in. And if we want to connect championships to our, our programs at Wichita State, um, this is an important element. It's not the most important element, but it is an element that we can't ignore. So as, as we're trying to like check the shockers in the portal, as far as men's basketball, I, you know, I think the, the retention piece this year, I mean, compared to others has been really good. It would appear two players in neither of which I think are terribly surprising based on all the circumstances. Now it's the recruitment piece that I think people are wondering about. The Shockers have been quiet so far in that front. There are a lot of great players still in the portal. There's already a lot of portal decisions that have been made. So where do things stand now for uh, for you guys, Coach Mills, what you're able to, you know, have these conversations or do? Like where, where what, what information can you give fans about how the portal process as far as bringing players in is right now for the Shockers? Yeah, I, I would just tell you that, um, you know, I think these words might be taboo in the industry, but it's reality. And I'm always going to be candid and, and transparent. And we're, we're going to uh, follow the guidelines here at Wichita State. But I will tell you, as a, as a overwhelming majority of those individuals that get into the portal are having conversations before the portal opens about where they're going to land. And they got a pretty good understanding of that. So there's a lot of this stuff that happens in the six to eight weeks leading up to the portal opening after selection Sunday. Um, and so it's important to understand, I believe it's a 45 day window from selection Sunday through uh, May 1st or 2nd is the transfer portal window. And I think, to be really clear for folks to understand that is the window for you to enter the portal, not for you to have made a decision and exit the portal. So semi, m many of these portal conversations will go on past when the portal, uh, the opportunity to enter the portal closes May 1st or 2nd. Um, so what I would tell you is clearly there's been a defined set of needs uh, for our roster and um, all of our programs from men's and women's basketball to others are actively engaging. We're hosting uh, recruits on campus. Um, you know, I, I think uh, obviously I can't disclose names, but women's basketball has got three on campus this week. And so uh, you're going to walk through the, the visit processes. Um, we've hosted a couple on the men's basketball side. Um, that part hasn't changed. Um, these young people still want to know where they're going. They want to see it. They want to feel it. They want to sit down and talk to coaches and talk about um, the role on the team and what this is going to look like for them and their development. And so that process takes time, particularly guys. And, and as I talk to so many of our fans, um, I think the piece that, that becomes um, maybe that brings the reluctance uh, to it is we, 
nobody desires a transactional process in NIL transfer portal and those sort of things. And at the end of the day, we're going to build a championship level program. NIL is important, but we also need to have young people in our program that understand what our program can do for them um, uh, and what they can do for our program. And so it, it, you got it takes time to develop those relationships because if we're going to be successful here, when we're going to be successful here, it will be because we're more relational and developmental in our approach rather than transactional. Um, so I would tell you that's a really long answer to say that um, it is the number one priority for men's and women's basketball at this point. And uh, every student athlete that's in the portal takes a different approach. Uh, they have advisors and they have family members and it's a team effort from their perspective and some will choose to make the decision early on because they don't want to deal with the hassle and some will choose to make the decision late uh, and there are risks with both um, so you see a wide variety of strategies uh, from folks in the portal but at the end of the day our coaches are actively engaging i think there's 1500 plus in the men's basketball portal right now guys so if you project that over 350 division one institution that's five per team on average that doesn't count the, those that graduate, right? Um, so you're looking at nationwide, probably in that range of six to eight that will turn every year. That's half your roster. Um, so when you talk about the retention piece, Jacob, I think our coaches have done a nice job uh, retaining uh, young men in our program comparison to that, that national average. I think following up on that, Kevin, you mentioned, and, and I, I like this, uh, this phrase, the the relational piece as opposed to transactional when it comes to the transfer portal and student athletes and all of that. How important is that piece on the NL, uh, the NIL side also where, you know, whether it's the the coaches or the players or you and your position being relational with the people who are contributing to NIL rather than it just being a, a transactional type thing. You know, we ask for your money so we can bring the players in and, and be able to compete, but actually working on building those relationships with those people who are investing in the programs. Yeah, I think, man, if you're going to, if you're going to take um, a transactional approach, um, I think it's going to be really, really difficult to build team chemistry uh, to build the things that are so important to team success, a commitment to development. I mean, at the end of the day, we're evaluating as an institution, we're evaluating young people's love for their sport, their desire to develop, their inquisitive nature. Um, yeah, you, you can evaluate technical skills and abilities. And I thought uh, Coach Mills did a nice job last week of kind of explaining, but most folks that are, are, are basketball fans and Wichita State is, is, I think well above average uh, in terms of uh, knowledgeable basketball fans, you can go into a gym and evaluate technical skills and abilities pretty quick. What takes the time is the character, the integrity, the work ethic, the love for the sport, the inquisitive nature. Do they have a coachable spirit? Um, talking to guidance counselors, coaches, all those things to figure out uh, what you're going to get. And I would ch challenge folks really to, to take a look at some of the uh, continuity and the retention that has happened in Coach Mills's teams at Oral Roberts, what will happen here, um, and I think he says so respectively because he is a humble um, leader. Uh, Coach Mills would would challenge um, most programs in the ability to evaluate the relational uh, elements of young people coming into our program. And at the end of the day, guys, that is going to win the day. The, those are the elements that will drive a young person to make 25,000 shots over six weeks. Those are the components yep. that will drive a young person to urgency and relationships in the locker room. Um, if you strictly take a transactional approach, um, you won't get the breadth and depth that will be required for us to win at a very high level. I, I think UConn is a great example of what you just said there. Uh, Kevin Saul, Wichita State Athletic Director here joining us. Let's chew the sports fat a little bit here, Kevin. We always have Always enjoy doing that. So a place you spent some time, uh, some time, I mean, more than a decade at Kentucky. Uh, <laughs> what an interesting scenario we've seen there with the Wildcats is John Calipari. I Look, I, I he was kind of run out of town is what it looks like. And he goes to Arkansas and now they've got an opening. It's funny to me, like, A, that Calipari's job wasn't good enough there. And now there's like what in the world is going to be good enough if he wasn't what what is that like there because i see some of these candidates and i'm like man i don't know if i'd 
go if it's more than just the money like that that's a crazy dynamic there in Kentucky that's unfolded over the last week or so. Yeah, I certainly appreciate that. We could probably chat for a long time about that as it relates to and projects to our entire industry. I, I will share respectfully, our plate is absolutely full here with uh, plenty of, of shockers on the plate. Um, I have spent zero time uh, digesting or trying to analyze what's going on in Lexington at this point in time. Obviously have tremendous uh, friends that I would consider family there and I try to leave them alone and let them do their business, particularly during uh, uh, urgent and pressing times like this. And usually there's a download later in terms of uh, the Paul Harvey, uh, the rest of the story. And, and you get that right, but at right. the end of the day. Um, these these jobs are not easy. And I think a coach's job is gets harder and harder, particularly with the NIL and the transfer portal piece, because at the end of the day, think about what a coach does. A coach develops. A coach pushes young people to levels of discomfort so that they can grow. And the portal is the antithesis of that. That is the, that is the out to hard and growth. And so I think our coaches walk a really fine line of recruiting our young people every single day, but also pushing them strong enough to develop. And it, again, this, I think, ironically connects to our previous conversation. If that's only transactional, well, when it gets hard, they'll pull the they'll pull the ripcord, they'll pull the parachute, and they'll go portal. Um, if if that's hard with a great relational approach uh, in your in your program with young people that are invested and everybody's on the same page and they're trying to maximize everything that we're doing, uh, then that portal is not a bright shiny thing that's hanging out there. So again, I I won't speak a whole lot in great deal to what's going on in Lexington, but I think you're seeing some of these dynamics play out. Uh, all across the country, whether you're seeing uh, Coach Vanderveer uh, retirement or you're seeing uh, coaches leave uh, premier jobs to go to, to other places. Um, I think all of the elements that we're talking about certainly play into it. I, I, yeah. And one thing that we we kind of joked about right right as we were finished, because th there are pieces of this that matter to us around here that we don't need to get into with you. But the, the one part that I do think is interesting is as f fans and consumers of college athletics at a really high level uh, yesterday is is you know it, when i when i see portal players enter people are like oh do, you know did the scholarships not mean anything and I, and i always am like that's not really fair to the kids because coaches do this literally all the time right they have contracts that they break all the time but that same narrative doesn't get tossed around sometimes i think with coaches or other people as it does with pay players that doesn't seem very fair to me um, uh, I mean, what, like sometimes there are just better fits other places, right? I think there's good and bad to it. Coaches, players, whatever to the movement. And sometimes other places might just be a better fit for somebody. Right. And then I think, um, Jacob, if you project that to a young person that might be in your program or is headed to another program, project that 10 years out, right. Uh, in a life where there's no portal in marriage. There's no portal in uh, full-time work. Yeah, you can you can transfer and transition and do all those things, but there's also a price to pay for that, right? Because right. I won't get into the details, but if, if you're just bouncing around from job to job every one or two years, it's going to be tough to build a career and to build some sustainability. Um, you know, the coaches are clearly on, on contracts, and we see all the dollars that get exchanged between institutions uh, and all those sort of things. And I think the the movement in general is good for our, for our young people. You also have to understand, and I mean this very respectfully, the data shows that the, the, the human brain's not fully developed until the age of 26, right? And so uh, what a 19-year-old believes might be the best thing for him or her at that, at that moment in time is probably going to be the best thing for him or her because that's what they believe. Now, fast forward 10 years down the road and look at it from the perspective of a 35-year-old that's had some life experience. You might look back at that and go, man, maybe I should have done this or maybe I should have done that. Yep. And it's certainly not our job to judge those decisions. We want to support our young people either way. Uh, but I think it's fair to say in some element that all the movement um, creates kind of this transitionary, transactional approach that will not serve our young people well when they enter a professional workforce. Kevin, I've got one more for you uh, that kind of is in this same world of transitions that we've been talking about, you know, for most of 
this segment. Uh, another transition in the midst of everything else going on at the conference level, Tim Pernetti, the new commissioner of the American Athletic Conference. Mike Oresco has been with the conference since it was put together back in 2013. So as the entire landscape of college athletics has been changing and, and is still sort of kind of in flux, there's a new man leading the conference that the Shockers are in. Uh, I don't know how much you can talk about that. I know that it was announced by the conference last week, but uh, what are your initial thoughts on this transition and the new leadership that the conference has? Well, obviously, uh, Commissioner Oresco has done a phenomenal job with this league, and you look at all the transition that has happened in this league, and and to position this league as the preeminent uh, group of five, borderline power five type league, and when you look at some of the successes in, in uh, respective sports, it's hard to argue that we're not, you know, the Americans not the best a group of five and or borderline power five in some spots. So um, I think he's done a phenomenal job. His background in television certainly has, has served the, the uh, league. Well, obviously Tim comes from a combination of an athletics uh, background. He played football at, at Rutgers. He's got administrative career at Rutgers um, has spent uh, the last several years um, in multimedia for IMG's uh, college sports business, the IMG Academy. So he's clearly plugged in with the ESPNs and the ABCs and the TV networks of the world, which is critical at this point in time. I was asked yesterday, what would his priorities be? And obviously I, I would leave that up to him. But if I'm a commissioner, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about um, uh, acquiring resources for your programs to continue to grow and build which comes through TV contracts and sponsorships, um, securing your league from a, a realignment standpoint. I think that's a constant theme that we'll see here for a while. Uh, so making sure that you're shored up in that piece, but also there's a learning curve, right? I mean, he's got 14 different institutions and presidents and athletic directors to get to know. And um, I've heard great things about him. I was able to connect with him the other day and I look forward to our one-on-one -on -one here in the next several weeks. And, and uh, I think he will do very well. He certainly has the background to, to understand what it is that we do and how we do it and how to make our lives better as we move forward. So uh, I certainly trust that. I appreciate our, our uh, presidential committee that, that walked through a, a, a long process to identify him. They did a nice job. So I look forward to working with Tim. Kevin Saul, Wichita State Athletic Director, joining us. A uh, tough night for Shocker Baseball and Softball. Last night for the baseball, it's right back at it today. They'll hit the road to K-State. Uh, that game begins at 6. You can hear that game here on KFH. Pre-game coverage with Mike Kennedy begins at 545. And then, Kevin, big conference weekends again. You get uh, baseball at home, bringing in Florida Atlantic. They need to snap this losing streak. Softball's on the road as they continue to try to redefine themselves a little bit. But baseball... Got to get something done here this weekend, right, against Florida Atlantic at home. Yeah, we do. You know, obviously, baseball through two weekends was leading the league, and I think they're down to a tie for fourth. Softball's in a tie for fourth. It's going to be a tight uh, standings all the way through in both sports. So every win matters. Uh, two one-run losses for baseball at South Florida. Um, a tough one last night. I think we stranded 16. Uh, we had 14 yeah. hits. You guys mentioned it was a four-plus hour uh, game, um, uh, you know, uh, Oklahoma State stranded a both runners as well. Yeah. So it was uh, literally a hit or two by either team, and it's an absolute blowout. So, um, but we're we're close there. I think we probably do some different things scheduling wise next year in baseball. We may load up some early weekends with four game sets and try and get ourselves to some single midweeks. Um, the double midweeks are great when you're playing the same team, but when you play two different teams and those two teams are only playing one in the midweek, then obviously they can throw more at it. So it's um, we'll be a little smarter in that as we move forward. Not an excuse, just a reality. And uh, look forward to the upcoming weekend. So as you mentioned, baseball's got Florida Atlantic. Um, and then softball's on the road to South Florida. That'll be an important series for them um, as we get into almost the midway point here in uh, baseball and softball league schedules. And again, baseball K-State tonight right here on KFH. Kevin, we appreciate the time. Let's do it in a couple of weeks. We'll, we'll keep our eye on that portal and good luck in the fundraising efforts and, and, uh, and everything else going on this time of year. Appreciate it. Sounds great. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate the opportunity to be on the show and go Shockers. There goes Kevin Saul, Wichita State Athletic Director. Uh, lots of good stuff there. Um, it's it is uh, it is an interesting time as as Wichita State. I, I do think he talked about the retention and recruitment. Look, there was less 
movement into the portal for Wichita State this year than we have seen in recent years. I do think that's significant. I think that that matters. Um, I think that's a positive sign, Tommy, to see guys sticking around more at a, at a higher clip. I, I think, you know, so often we think about it as who's coming in. Man, in this world of the portal, you got to also think about it at who's who's staying. And and so I think you've got two different things happening there. And we've we've heard accounts of in the past guys not staying because there just wasn't enough opportunity here in the NIL space. And so that's good. I think that's promising as we look at that program uh, front and center to, to where we see things go. All right, we're going to take a quick break. So we'll get some reaction to that conversation. Uh, we'll talk a little Royals baseball. Come on now. Knocking off the Astros, extra innings, walking off. Who's ready for baseball season? We're, we're, we're loving it. By the way, ESPN Bet, ready to take you through all the huge sports moments this spring. The exclusive sports book of ESPN has it all, including exclusive offers and promotions from Scott Van Pelt and Stephen A. Smith. From the playoff intensity to getting on the links and out to the ballpark, there's no better time to be sports fans. Sign up today and new users get $100 in bonus bets for making any sports book bet. Download ESPN Bet today. What a play. Must be 21 plus. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler in partnership with Hollywood Casino at Kansas Speedway. Terms and conditions apply. See app for details. I checked ESPN Bet last night, Tommy, for the Royals. Plus, like 200 to 1 to win the World Series. You got to sprinkle a little 200 to 1. I mean, did come on now. On you jumped on it? Good. I did. I did. I threw I threw a little at it. Just why not? Hey, it did me well last year with the Rangers. Let's let's try to make another futures bet here this year. Uh, big odds still on the Royals who look like they're, 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 this thing might be for real. We'll talk about it next on Sports Daily. Ninety seven five and 1240 KFH. Vasque Footwear has delivered functional, durable footwear to millions of...
Sports Daily on KFH. On your way into work, you want to keep listening to Sports Daily even after you park the car with the Odyssey app and odyssey.com. You can just download the app or visit odyssey.com and search for KFH. Download the Odyssey app today to get started. Uh, appreciate Kevin Saul for stopping by and spending it's a good amount of time. Get caught up on you know the recruiting world for men's basketball, the NIL perspective. Uh, spend a little time there with with baseball and softball, who both need to you know get things turned around here. Both in a bit of a, a skid right now. Uh, Andrew chimes in. You can always, by the way, watch the show on Facebook, on YouTube, and on X. Andrew chimes in on YouTube. Says he understands that Saul was employed by Kentucky, but asking him about their hoops opening signaled a lack of preparation and seriousness by our hosts. Plenty of Wichita State related questions that could have been asked. Lack of preparation. I think we're pretty prepared that we remembered he coached at Kentucky, uh, not coached, was at Kentucky for more than a decade. Uh, Andrew, listen, I will tell you this right now, and I make no bones about this. I've had this philosophy for a long time, uh, and it's a transitioned philosophy for me. First and foremost, when we talk about things on this show, we will begin and end the conversation and show prep with what is the most interesting thing to our listeners. Um, and I, we could have a, a gr great argument off the air on what's more interesting, uh, a struggling um, softball or baseball program right now or the biggest job opening in the country that has ripple effects all over the country to connections and everything else and just happened to chance into an opportunity to talk to somebody that was there for more than a decade when coach Cal was in his. So uh, we could debate that uh, I guess, I suppose, but Tommy, first and foremost, we're an interesting first show here at sports daily. I want to be very clear and, uh, and just say here off the top, I didn't ask any Kentucky questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to throw you under the bus a little bit, Andrew. I think so if you could revise your comment, and say a lack of preparation oh, and seriousness by host. our yeah. host. Because uh, I didn't ask any Kentucky questions. Um, so I'm going to totally wash my hands of that. I would venture to guess that uh, uh, you will have more interesting, less cookie-cutter questions asked of a lot of people here uh, maybe than than you would in other places. And, and I, again, I'm not going to apologize for that. Uh, you know, that's the most interesting story in the country right now. Period. I remember back Full to, uh, I think it was the very first time that we had Paul Mills on our show after he was hired and you asked him about being an Astros fan, you know, yeah. like it's just, it's okay. I they mean, were whatever. in the ALCS at that point, right? Yeah. Like it was a, it was, it was, there was a topical nature to that. That was a little, a, a little rib there. Um, but yeah, like I, I do think it's, it's and, 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 and in full transparency, I was using that to sort of get to the point we had made about how coach movement is not viewed the same way in college athletics as player movement. That's why I brought up Kentucky was to get Kevin's take on that. Uh, so it wasn't and even I, really yeah. intended to care about the Kentucky opening from Kevin's perspective. I wanted to get more into, um, and we just, we, we did a little bit there in a follow-up. I, I, I do want to know, like from coaches and administrators perspectives, does it? I, I know it bothers some some of them that players are moving around, but it is a little silly that coaches and administrators move around and break their contracts literally every day in college sports. Yet we don't hold them to the same standard we do these young people, and how you know how they don't have any sense of commitment or any of these things. Like they're not doing anything different than coaches and administrators have been doing for a long time. I'm just trying to get his perspective on that as much as anything. I don't care what he thinks about Cal. Um, uh, but it was, it just, there was a, there was a transitionary period. There. The, the one thing I do also want to say about Kevin Saul specifically and, and why I appreciate him, him being on our show every other week is that, you know, he brings a level of perspective from a, from a top level type view, you know, asking Absolutely. him about the world of college athletics in general, uh, in, in a world where there's a lot of different changes and movement and, you know, things are not always super clear, um, you know, talking about the world of NIL and, of course, relating it back to Wichita State and getting more specific as far as, you know, some of those initiatives, you know, but I, I think and, and he's been clear with us, I think, on this show, too, over the last couple of years when we have and I've done it, I'm guilty of it, have tried to ask him specific questions about like in the weeds about different sports yeah, it's our job. And he'll say, 
I'm going to leave that up to the coach to answer that question. Yeah. Okay. So he's, he's wanting to have more of a top level conversation. So I do appreciate that being able to ask him more big picture type questions about just the landscape in general and Always. not necessarily just about this, this program or the, this, this university. I love philosophical questions when it comes to college sports. Love it, love it. And I do love that Kevin Saul will answer them. It's our job to ask a question. It's his job to not answer it. Like just understand that too. Just cause I, you got to ask the question. Uh, by the way, speaking of this, and you want to know, you want me to, you want me to make like a backwards crazy tie-in from Kentucky to Wichita State. Uh, uh, buddy Brandon Zinner over at Twelve News just sent me somebody tweeting. The flight watches are are in play now, of course, for uh, Waco to Lexington, and there has been one. Um, and I've been on the end of that. I've I've sat and staked out an airport before when when Alabama was coming after Greg Marshall. So I've been there. But if you want to, if you want like a weird, odd connection there, how about uh, Scott Drew goes to Kentucky, Jerome Tang does not go to Baylor and stays in Manhattan, Grant McCaslin stays in Lubbock and Texas Tech. Who's the next in-house Baylor guy? I said it's that Paul yesterday. Mills. I said that right? yesterday. Yeah. I mean, they, there are so there you go. Of, there's yeah, your connection. There's a number yeah. of uh, coaches from that coaching tree. We talked about it yesterday from the Scott Drew coaching yeah. tree. Um, I think you said yesterday when I brought that up, you're like, oh, they'll they'll go outside of the coaching tree, then they'll find you know somebody else. I would think that I would think that they would. By the way, I'm I'm kidding. I it's it's just it's the same thing with you know I think Tang would be a home run at Kentucky. He's only been a head coach for two years. It's a it's a similar thing for I think a guy like Mills and Baylor, right? He's only had the opportunity to be at Wichita State for a year, and then Oral Roberts. I, you know, I don't know that the ba but maybe Baylor would. I don't know Baylor's situation, but I think you would if you were trying to guess at who they would target first. It would start with Tang and McCasland, and then maybe it does get there. I don't know. I don't. I don't think it would, but maybe it would if you want a connection. But anyway, I was just having a little fun. Andrew, we do appreciate you listening. We appreciate your comments all the time, even if they're negative. I really don't care. I I love the commentary and I love people chiming in. You can do that on our video streams, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and X. Let's talk a little baseball here uh, for a few minutes, Tommy, with the Royals. Walk-off winners against the Astros. Hey, look, uh, it was a good performance out of Cole Reagans. I'd like to see him stretch these out and stop, you know, allowing so many base runners. But he did get you through five, three runs. You don't like that. Uh, not his best performance, but it's against one of the best lineups in baseball. So it's understandable. But man, you get three shutdown shutout, or sorry, five shutdown shutout innings from your bullpen and an extra inning win against that team and that lineup, none of which were Will Smith. Uh, I hate being a Will Smith. I'm not a Will Smith hater. I'm not, I promise. He just doesn't need to be this team's closer. Um, but that was, you know, for 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 as rocky as the bullpen looked early, it is settling in just a little bit. And if the bullpen can be respectable, let's say league average, Tommy, and the starters continue to give you what they've given you. I'm not saying they're going to have the second best ERA in baseball, you know, all year long. But if they're above average, if they're good, if the bullpen is average, the lineup is what it is. I think it can be average at least right if not you know a little above average this is a team that can win this division i'm telling you it is i think the thing that's been the most impressive lately in this winning streak that they've had is not just the fact that they're winning but how they're winning these games you know and and they've in multiple multiple days multiple games they've fallen behind early uh and then they've just been able to battle back take the lead and then hold on to win and you know of course it was um, a walk-off win last night. Great to see that happen with Salvi, um, you know, being able to get the walk-off winner and just battling and holding tough. There have been a lot of Royals teams over the last several years that it doesn't even matter if they have a lead late or if they're tied late or whatever. You're like, yeah, the, te the team's not going to pull it out. They don't have the firepower to be able to do that. If they're down, they don't have the firepower to come back. If they're ahead, they could easily lose the lead. I mean, it's just everything you could think of um, to lose games. That's what they were doing. So the fact that, you know, not only are they winning games, but in a lot of cases, they're coming from behind and being able to hang with it, hang tough and let the offense go to work for them while, you know, basically holding those leads or holding. I mean, like, keep in mind, and it was I think it was James MacArthur last night that and Bobby Wood Jr. had a spectacular defensive play to basically keep the game tied again, Th things like that weren't happening in the past with this Royals team. And so they've been able to keep the team in it 
into extra innings and then set up an opportunity for Salvi to have a walk off. So that's the impressive thing. I like that they have punched the gas here early in the season. I know that we it wasn't that long ago uh, that we were really bemoaning the bullpen, and I think for good reason. But things, yeah, to and your I'm still point, worried about it. To your point, they've settled in a little bit, but it's really been they've been able to overcome that. Um, you know, they're seven and four now uh, on the season, and you know, I, I saw this yesterday, and it just took me back to how bad things were a year ago. It took the Royals 28 games last year to get to seven wins. It took them 11 games this year to get to seven wins. You know, so it's a night and day difference. Of course, now you just have to keep that up. You got the Astros. They're going to be tough. The bullpen thing is interesting to me, Tommy, because it wasn't so much like it's too early in the season to know if they have the horses in the bullpen. It's not too early in the season to rearrange those horses. And so, you know, I hope that Quattraro is doing, I think he is. I think he's telling us he is. Will Smith didn't pitch in that game. And it was a tie game slash had a lead, right? That he didn't pitch. So that tells you that there is already a reshuffling. I think, you know, when teams are not as talented in the bullpen, and it's too early to say that for the Royals, then it becomes more about, you know, can you be a bullpen whisperer as a manager and just pull the right strings, push the right buttons at the right times? That is what's made uh, a lot of big league managers good. I, I, I think, honestly, it has been. Uh, of all the skills of a guy like Bruce Bochy, if you think back to those Giants years, if you think back to last year, the thing to me that he's done better than anybody else is be a bullpen whisperer and know when to go to certain guys in certain situations. Now, some managers have had the luxury of just having like this incredible, you know, back end of a bullpen where you just slot that in. And that that's great if you can have it, but that's not what the Royals, I don't think, are going to have. So can they... You know, can Quattraro and, and staff become bullpen whisperers to some degree and really dig into matchups and numbers and tendencies? Bruce Bochy was ahead of the game on that stuff. Tony La Russa, you know, Grandpa Sammy up in heaven, don't, you know, don't strike me down for saying this because he hated Tony La Russa. Tony La Russa, he was Cardinals fan, hated Tony La Russa. <laughs> Tony La Russa did that well, though, right? I get, I didn't like it either because he did it too. But he was a bullpen whisperer, right? He he knew what buttons to push, and that made him successful. So can the Royals do that this year? Yeah, I think they can. Are they more talented in the bullpen maybe than we initially thought? I still think it's too early to say that. I'm not sure yet. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know the answer to that but I do know it was time to shuffle and they've done that. So credit to them. It worked out for them last night. Hopefully it can continue to do that. And, and isn't the whole point of having a coach like Matt Quattrero, I mean, he's there to be able to figure those things I think out. So, right. Yep, I think so. Because yep. it's not a, and I know development is really important and that's a, that's a key piece of why Quattrero is there. But remember he came from the Rays. We've talked about that all the time. And that organization not only was really good at developing players, but also in-game management to get the most out of the players that they had on their roster because they knew they weren't going to be superstars. And, you know, outside of Bobby Witt Jr., Salvi, you know, whatever, it's not like there are superstars a, a lot of the time uh, on the Royals roster. So Cotrero is there to get the absolute most and the best out of the players on the roster. And a lot of that, that goes back to the bullpen. You know, it's they, there are not there are not stars in that bullpen. Will Smith is the closest and he's not a star. You know, he's a champion, but he's not a star and he's over the edge. You know, he's he's past his prime a little bit. Um, you know, so I think that that's important to know, too, that part of the, the I mean, one of the major reasons that he's there is to manage these situations and to be willing to say, you know, look, we're, we have to adjust this. We have to rearrange it. You know, I, I, everybody knows that I'm a massive Braves fan and Brian Snicker is a great manager and he's been that way for a long time. But one of the biggest knocks on him is that he's set in his ways with his bullpen and how he's going to utilize them. And sometimes to his own detriment, Dave Roberts with the Dodgers is the same way. He's been raked over the coals, but for they've being got, very but they've set got in their the, ways on bullpens, but they've yeah. got the names, right? Like they've got the yeah. big contracts and the names. That's different. You can be flexible. If you're Matt Quattrero to try to figure out what the best fit in your bullpen well, is. And time will tell, right? Ned Yost won a World Series and went to two based on slotting guys in. Ron Washington went to a World Series based on slotting guys in. The Yankees built a dynasty as being sort of 
the first that I can recall, and, and again, there, I'm sure there have been others, but of really like, this is your portion of the game, no matter what else happens, go get it. I mean, so it, it, there are lots of different ways to do it. And Quattraro, yeah, he's there for development, but once the season starts, like he's not, he doesn't get to do very much to yeah. develop the pitchers in it's the minor leagues. Management. Like that's all stuff that happens. So it becomes in-game management. It's it becomes the right developing the pitchers you've got. And so I, I wish, and I hope that the Royals do clearly define some of these roles because it means guys are doing really well, but if that's not there, and again, it's way too early in a bullpen full of guys, none of us have ever seen pitch before right now to know if that's the case. I am very excited to see him quickly pivot on what was very clearly not working early. And so yeah, th that to me gives me a lot of um, hope that it can be a bullpen that's functional this year. Yeah. And think about, knowing that this the bullpen is absolutely the Achilles heel currently of this team, if he is able to push the right buttons and get it worked out by the time August rolls around, September rolls around, if he can get that part of it figured out, it becomes a pretty complete ball club for the most part if yeah. everything and they can, can continue. And you can go trade for bullpen arms too. I mean, that's the thing. Like You can do that, and if they're in a position to do that, I would guess that they would because they need the momentum right now with fan base to try and convince them that they want a ballpark downtown. It couldn't, you could not have better timing if you're the Royals than to be really good right now. So uh, they play again against the Astros today. Uh, you'll have Wichita state baseball here with us on KFH, but you can always catch the Royals on the Odyssey app. We're going to take a quick break. More sports daily right after this. 97.5 and 1240 KFH. Calling all off.
you. You got to hear this. Go ahead. I think I want to hear this. Sports Daily is on KFH. Join KNSS and Odyssey Radio for Open Streets ICT, a free community building event bringing Wichitans of all ages and fitness levels together to promote healthy, active living and social engagement. That's April 14th uh, coming up here on this weekend, and that would be Sunday from 12 to 4 at uh, Wichita State and Shocker neighborhood, Open Streets ICT. Uh, Tommy, it is official now for Cal in Arkansas. We knew that. Um, we have flight aware, flight tracking people, uh, taking flights from Waco to Lexington. So we will keep an eye on that certainly. And what is, what, what do we have? Here? Yeah. So just a few minutes ago, John Rothstein, uh, reported that Kentucky plans to officially meet with Baylor Scott Drew regarding its head coaching vacancy in the near future. So I know there's been the flight tracking and all of that, that, that would line up, um, with, with that report that just came down a few minutes ago. Now, what does that mean? I think you have to pause there because I watched the same flights. I've camped out airports and watched Alabama court and offer Greg Marshall a big raise and this high profile school. And I watched Wichita State take the opportunity to get him the money uh, to get him to stay after all that happened. So because Scott Drew is flying to, you know, right now, Lexington doesn't mean he's accepting that job. It means he's taking the meeting. Uh and we'll see what that means. And then after that, if he does take it, then we'll see what it means for Baylor. And then it becomes the thing that we have to watch with Jerome Tang. So it's a story that affects us greatly here. I wish it didn't, but it does. And we'll continue to follow it. We're going to come back. We'll tell you what's on the network today. Sports Daily wrapping up a Wednesday right after this. Spring is in the air. And that-
All right, that's it for us. Regular programming today, Shocker Baseball again on the road tonight. You'll hear the game beginning at 545, 6 o'clock first pitch. Mike Kennedy has the call for you here. Uh, Tommy, we'll be back tomorrow. I'm curious to see now. We're, we're sort of in streak watch for the Royals here. That's a significant win streak. Um, can they keep it going against the Astros and do us all a favor? Yeah, we'll it's going to be fun to watch, and uh, I'm sure more college basketball coaching news. Oh, yeah. We might uh, we might have our attention shifted tomorrow. We'll find out. We will. In one way or the other, it'll either be a non-story for Jerome Tang or a big story for Jerome Tang, probably as early as tomorrow. All right, uh, that's it. Appreciate Max for being in. Thanks for commenting. Thanks for calling. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with more Sports Daily.